That is what we're going to talk about tonight. So we're going through these one at a time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started. We thank you, Father, for your everlasting love for us and for all the saints. Lord, I just thank you that even though many are out tonight, Lord, I pray that what we have come to do would be a blessing to us. Lord, it would be purposed before the foundation of the world that we are who we are this evening. And Lord, we are purposed to pray for one another. You have called us to do that. You have stirred our hearts to do that. So we pray, Lord, for all of the circumstances, the marriages, the, the, the frustrations, the pain, the suffering, the fear, the hatred, everything, Lord, that could possibly be boiling in our souls and minds. God, we thank you for your glorious grace and that you pushed you put Christ on the cross and punished him in our stay so that we might be called your righteousness. We have been adopted by your love and because of your love for us. And Lord, I pray that as we hear your word tonight, that it would be more than just a study in Romans, but God, also the salve and the ointment to our souls, to our minds, to our hearts, that we might rejoice, that we may be fulfilling, uh, uh, that we would see that you are fulfilling a greater purpose in our life than that which we can see and in that we trust, and in you we trust, and in all the circumstances therein we rejoice. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so Romans chapter 8. Was that my daughter? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Romans chapter 8. Um, in this golden chain, we're going to specifically deal with the call. The call and what most people would call the effectual call of God. The effectual call of God. And when you think of a call, what do you think? You think of someone getting in touch with you. you someone leaving you a message. Someone, you know, trying to contact you. And so a lot of times people believe that the call of God is just like that. That God is trying his best to get in touch with folks, tap them on the shoulder, get their attention, but that's not how God operates. We know that God doesn't operate that way because God is not beholden to the will of volition of his creatures. God is not beholden to, um, to answer anything that his creatures would suggest he answer. God is not beholden in any way whatsoever to this idea uh, that he is offering something that we can refuse. If we and our volition and our will are connected in any way to our justification, then we indeed are a condition. Our personhood is part of the condition of our justification, of our salvation, and therefore we are instrumental in its cause. And so when we think about the calling, there have been uh, debates through the years about the call of God. People say, well, God calls everybody. Doesn't God preach the gospel to all people? Doesn't, didn't Jesus preach in, in front of the multitudes? Didn't uh, the, doesn't the scripture teach us to share the gospel? Yes, absolutely. And so as I begin tonight, I want to talk about two distinctions of the idea of the call. One in a general sense that's not really given by God. It's just through men, through the word. And this outward call, if you will, whereby we could go out on that corner and we could talk and, and talk to people and we can proclaim the gospel of grace. We can tell people that Christ is God who created the world and everything in it. And that he created a woman and before the foundation of the world he purposed to create a body for himself inside of her. And he was born of this virgin and lived a life of obedience as a human being. Still being truly God at the same time. And in doing so he fulfilled all righteousness all obedience, all perfection, that God was pleased with him in his humanity just as much as God was pleased with God the Son in his divinity. And then he willfully laid down his life to be propitiation in order to justify God's people, the elect, those for whom Christ died and then was raised to life. He took his life up again. We could, we could proclaim all of the finished works, the ins and outs of the gospel of grace. We could talk about those things and in doing so, in a technical sense, we can say we are providing a general call. Because what is that call after, after that proclamation? Is to believe in this truth. Change the way you think in regard to salvation and justice and righteousness. Change the way you think in regard to all of these things. And believe in this finished work of Jesus Christ. Not just the details of Him and His work, but the 
um, the efficacy of his work, that he accomplished something in a great way. This is what we need to make sure that we understand. But yes, so there is this idea that there is a call, but when we see this particular thing, we see it coupled with what? We see this foreknowledge of God, and we learned three or four weeks ago that foreknowledge has everything to do with affection, that God has a favor toward those he foreknows in the same way it could be illustrated that God's love and God's foreknowledge are synonymous. So that God foreknows, he loves, he also predestines, he elects. And that's what we talked about last week. God elects or predestined those for whom Christ would die before there ever was a world or a cosmos to reveal his glory and ever a people ever existing in time. God purposed all of that in order to save his people out of the world. This is what we believe because this is what scripture reveals. And so in all these things, there is only one then reality of those he predestined, he also called. So these things are true equally. For those who he foreknew, they are all predestined, and all those that are predestined are all called, and all those that are called are all justified, and all those that are justified are all glorified. So there is no separating, well, somebody was called, but he wasn't justified. Or somebody was justified, but he wasn't called. It cannot be. That's the point of this. The church in Rome, in all of their suffering, is is resting in the finished work of Christ to such a degree that there is nothing that can shake them because they're continually being taught by the Holy Spirit in the most difficult of times that their salvation is absolute. It's absolute. Absolute. So then we come to this essence, to the essence of what... This call is. And I see Sir Noah now. What is this call referred to here? We use the term effectual call. The effectual call. And the effectual call is where God overpowers the heart, the mind, the soul, the will, the volition, the desire, the affections of a human being and makes them alive through regeneration. That's what the outward call, that's what the inward call is. The effectual call of God is this this work that God causes someone to be born again. Not just like a horn blowing on the street. Get out of the way, pay attention, listen to me. It's not just that, it's more than that. You're mine, that's what the inward call says. You belong to me. I've snatched you out of death and and dumbness. I've snatched you out of deafness. I've snatched you out of blindness. I've given you everything in Christ. Behold. And we see it. We see it. That's what's so damnable about all the realities of the synergistic and, oh goodness, free will mentality of the work of God in Christ. That's why it's so damaging to the culture in which we live because many people have a resting place in something they accomplished. Let me say this, and I can say this in here, but it's, it's, it's terrible for me to say it out there. But I, one day I'm going to, or somebody's going to listen to something like this, and they're going to go, oh, you're talking about me. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. But over the last two plus decades, I have heard a thousand times as if I've heard it once. When someone professes faith, These types of words. I am so proud of you. And I just want to walk up and go, What are you talking about? You know, and pop them in the head. What are you talking about? I mean, I saw this just last week. Somebody sent me this little link and said, Look here, I'm so proud of my grandson. Oh, what do you do? When the spelling bee? Oh, he was baptized. I'm so proud of him. He, I'm so thankful, Johnny, that you made this wonderful decision. To what? Wet yourself? I mean, what are we talking about here? This is not a decision of man to be born again. It makes no sense to me. Well, how do you know this? Well, we've already gone through this a thousand times probably in the last few years. But we are deplorable people. We are broken, wicked, evil, sinful, 
ridiculously separated from God in a judicial way, in a spiritual way. We are antithetical to everything righteous and holy and good. There is none good, no, not one. Not one seeks after God. Not one does righteousness. No, not one. Paul would say in Romans 3, referring to many Old Testament texts. So that means that the reason there has to be such a powerful call of God to rip our hearts into a new place is because in the essence of man's depravity, there is no possible way in which he could come to the will or to the place in his will to be made righteous. He doesn't want it. And many people say, well, I can't argue that. You, um, you... You know, I know a lot of folks who wanted to be right with God, like Esau, like Pharaoh, like Judas. How many people do we know that want to be right with God? A lot of them. We misappropriate the use of the law. We think that the law of God will teach them what God requires and then scare them into coming to a decision that they need to get right with God and then the using of the law causes them to think they can work themselves back into a place of righteousness. Oh, and by the way, because you can't do that, Jesus died for you. Oh, great, that makes it easier. Nobody has come to Christ of their own volition. Though we willfully and joyfully and desirably believe in Christ. We desire Him. We know why. Because we've been made alive. We've been called by God effectually. And if it weren't for that... In our state of depravity, we are at the beckon of the call of Satan. We are always at the call of our flesh. And see, here's something about free will. Those who are unregenerate, absolutely, in their own understanding, in their own logic, in their own philosophy, have libertarian free will to do everything they want. That's what they believe. Why? Because they're blinded to see the difference. They're blinded to see anything else. They have no ability to come because they're in a state of darkness. They're in a state of blindness. And this blindness is deceitful. This blindness is sealed. This blindness does not allow them to have the strength to even see the righteousness of God and the work of Christ. No matter how they may twist it or play it, Think of the Pharisees. We're going through that on Sunday. Think of the Pharisees, how devout they were to, quote, God, and how passionate they were about, quote, righteousness. Yet Jesus' own words are that they belong to Satan, and all the works they do are Satan's works. How is it that Satan's works are to teach of the God of of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Because when we teach him wrongly, we teach just as Satan taught Eve in the garden. Did God really say, see, God knows that when you eat of this, you will be like him and you have the knowledge of good and evil. A true statement. But in that, he implied the character of God was withholding in a maniacal way. (laughs) I don't want these people to be happy. (laughs) On the alternative was, the antithesis, the reality was that it was life and death. We are unable, as if we put it in the way they used to put it in in, in antiquity, theologians of yesterday, they used to say man is utterly, in his depravity, impotent to all spiritual realities. Not that we want to use that too much in our public discussions. (laughs) But there's no strength, there's no volition, there's no opportunity for humanity because of the pollution and the damnable position that we find ourselves in in our depravity could ever answer a sincere call of God. It's not possible. It's not possible. I even said Tuesday in our high school Bible class that, you know, the youth ministry of my day when I was a young, young, younger guy, it... It, it sort of went something like this. We want to get all the youth together. We want to get them to talk about and think about all the things they do in life. And we want them to gauge those and put them on a scale of good or bad. And the things that are bad, we want to tell them that they need to get rid of them in their lives. Like the afterglow bonfires with the cassette tapes. Yeah? Or the CDs. We finally graduated the CDs, but I was too old to be 
burning music I paid for when I started buying CDs. I won't do that. But I've seen a lot of that take place. And then we're going to scare children, young people, young adults into being abstinent because of the wickedness of that. And we wonder why we have hang-ups in our day. We, we, then we want to talk about the, the dangers and the evils of, of how we take care of our bodies. We don't put substances in our bodies that we shouldn't put in our bodies. And as long as we're doing this, we're honoring and glorifying God. And it is glorifying to God to take care of our bodies, to, to, to steer away from sexual immorality, to, to do and, and, and strive for purity, and to have purity of our mind and our eyes and our ears and of our mouth, to set ourselves apart in some way to give glory and honor to God for the sake of our intimate relationships with the body and for the sake of our witness in the world. Yes, we do these things, but that's not what youth ministry was in my day. It was, here's all that bad stuff. Now, when you give it up, you are more dedicated to God now than you ever were. And the alt alt of that was that, look at all this good stuff you're doing. Do you really do it with all passion? Do you do it with all affection? Are you really willing to lay it all down for Jesus? Looks like you love baseball more than Jesus. Looks like you love chess more than Jesus. Looks like you love instruments and music more than Jesus. Looks like you love that Walkman more than Jesus. So then what do you do? Then all these good things then become opportunities for the bonfire. And then you strive, and all of a sudden you're just like this weird kid who just preaches the gospel everywhere, carrying a Bible. You get called a Bible thumper when you're 15, 16 years old. This is my testimony. And you wonder, why is it the Bible says that Christ suffered for my sins and saved me? And all these well-meaning, wise, spiritually discerning adults are trying to push me into something that... I don't even see in the Bible. Now you start talking that when you're 16 years old and see what happens to your, to your uh, what is the word? <laughs> to your face. Because you talk to the wrong adult in a way of inquiring and you're rebuking them. You're not being respectful. You're asking too many questions. Friends, the problem is, is that most of the world of Christendom today believes that man is inherently good, and if we can get control of our young people and get them on a right path of doing righteous deeds, then Christianity will grow. No, Judaism will grow. And as Judaism grows, Romanism grows, and as Romanism grows, Satanism grows, because it's all the same thing. It's all humanism. And sometimes it's in the name of Christ, with the words of Christ, and the book of Christ, and the people of Christ, But it's abuse. It's abuse in every turn to tell someone that they should do that which they cannot do and that it pleases God and it changes their state before God to some kind of affection from Him. I don't know, maybe all of us in the room, if we were to think about it very hard, or maybe not so hard at all, maybe we could actually testify to that same thing, that we lived in a place of fear and guilt and condemnation and self-loathing, loathing. Wondering if we were ever going to be in a place where we could please the Lord. And what's crazy about it is even when we were the impeccable picture of morality and cultural righteousness, we still never felt good enough to be right with God. Because we're never good enough to be right with God. Because only one person who has ever lived in this life as a human being has ever been good enough to be right with God. And His name is Jesus. He was called the Christ. He is Messiah He is the Son of the living God eternally. We are in a condition that prohibits coming to God because we are in a state of damnation. We are born under the curse of sin. The wrath of God abides upon us, John 3. Now we're not going to argue, those of you who listen to the Sunday night Q&A, you know, this past Sunday night I answered a question about, or the week before I answered a question about, is there ever really a time that the wrath of God is looming over the elect? And the answer to that is no. But the scripture shows us in the narrative and the illustrations of the gospel that we cannot say that to an unbeliever. Because we must adhere to the instructions, the outlines of the text, which are not contradictory so we hold fast to that those who are not believing the wrath of God remains and that is the call 
of the general sense. That is the proclamation of a general sense. But I guess the next question should come, and how in the world does, the, does the, a special call, does this effectual call come? How does it come? Well, it comes by the Word. <laughs> it comes by the Word of God alone. Paul would say in Romans 8, that there, I mean Romans, um, Romans 10, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the words of Christ. So that Jesus in John 3, as he tells Nicodemus that his confession of faith, that Jesus is the one come from God, the prophet, Messiah. It's the only one they were looking for. That's why John the Baptist answers the way he does when they say, Who are you? If you come in the spirit of Elijah, are you the prophet? No, I am not the Christ. That's what he answers because he, he knows what he's talking about. They don't. And he says to Nicodemus, You must be born again in order to see. You're blind, Nicodemus, and you cannot see no matter what you profess. And though your logical mind puts around all the prophecies of the Word and you see me fitting them very clearly, you still are not trusting in me as your mediator and as your propitiation, as the instrument of justification on your behalf. You are trusting in yourself. You are trusting in your works. You are trusting in your knowledge. You are trusting in your belief and having faith in your own faith. You must not have these things. To that, the apostles would declare repent of that self-righteous thinking. And the means of the effectual call, Jesus said, is through His Word, or the Scripture says is through the Word. But how is it that the Word makes the call effectual? Didn't you just say that was a, just preaching the Word of God doesn't save everyone? Absolutely not. It cannot for it was not intended to do so. But it will call to those who are the elect of God. It will call to those for whom Christ died, those who have been given to the Son by the Father, and they will indeed hear. They will hear. The Word of God is the instrumental cause of our conversion, our regeneration. The Spirit is the one who causes it to take effect. He is the efficacy of our call. We, if we were to play a song, and when you hear the song like most of the large megachurches that I've been a part of through the years, when the music starts, people would know, oh, service is coming. So there'd be a song playing or what we call to what? Call to worship, you know, and here's the 50 billion people singing and everything's playing. And everybody goes, oh, it's time to put down the coffee and donut. Or whatever else I might have. And let's just go meander in there and meander into that room. It's a call to worship. But does that call, does that organ, does that piano, does that electric guitar, does that drum set, do do those amazing voices cause people to worship? No, not at all. Neither does the preaching that I do or that you may do or the sharing of the gospel that you may do through the Word of God. Is it really... Every time, is it a magic formula that every time I share the gospel, God's going to save the hearer? No, I'm just like the music starting the worship service. The Holy Spirit is who applies it to the life of the elect. The Holy Spirit makes it come alive. As Acts 10 would tell us that the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word and they believed. It is not the work of the preacher that causes salvation. It is the work of Christ by the Spirit through His Word that causes salvation. And I'm using that term interchangeable in this context about the effectual call, regeneration. Salvation involves all of these things. So some people, the reason I make the distinction is some people say, Oh, that's not about our justification, our sin. Let's don't conflate these terms all into one thing, but let's call them all one thing, and that is salvation. Salvation. So the call that works is through the word by the Spirit. And God has decreed this as He sees fit by the counsel of His own will to call His people to Himself in such a way and at such a time that pleases Him. God has used the natural means of men's voices, humanity's voices, and the natural means of the vernacular of language and syntax to be to reveal Himself, and through the Spirit, by these natural means, He calls His people. And so we don't have to worry about what else we must do in order to call sinners to faith and call the elect of God to hope or to truth. 
The world is, is just full of, of nonsense and silly opportunities that try to get people involved in the assembly of the body of Christ where there is no body to be found nor no gospel to be heard nor no effectual work of God the Holy Spirit in any aspect of any corner of the room. Maybe the rats who eat out of the trash cans may have more spirituality than some people. At least they're doing that which they were created to do. Well, when it's all said and done, the world and religious people who are not converted, who have not had the call of God effectually, they continue to consider what they might do to employ methods to reach others. What can we do to get this crowd? And then they have this special place in their heart sometimes to say, you know, there's a group of folks that we've just been blind to. We haven't seen the railroad children. They're living out there amongst the bushes out there by the railroad tracks. And we've just ignored them. So let's do something that will appeal to them. What do you do? I don't know. I just made it up the top of my head there. I don't have an explanation of what we could do. But I guarantee you, if I drop that into some think tanks, a.k.a. elders meetings or leadership team meetings, they would come up with some incredible opportunities Well, we know that every morning when they hear the train coming, they run the other way because they don't want to get smashed. Maybe we could have them something to eat when they come over here. Give them a hot dog. Get a kid a hot dog, they'll follow you off a cliff. The Pied Piper didn't play music that was magical. He had hot dogs. See, I had hot dogs, and every child in the room went, what? Hot dog. (laughs) Say donut, that gets the other half. Maybe potato chip. Or here it is. How about some candy? (laughs) That's it. All the teenagers just salivated. All right, so there's always something to try to draw someone to Christ. And the Spirit is the only one who will bring him. The Word of God being taught. That's why it is deplorable when churches continue in a manner inconsistent with the, with the strict prescription of the New Testament that don't teach the saints the Word of God. What can we do to grow our church? Teach the Scripture to the body of Christ. Feed them well, they will grow. Feed them well, they will flourish. Feed them well, they will fight the good fight. Feed them well, they will resist temptation. Feed them well, but feed them not. And they'll rot. I just made a poem, didn't even realize it. So this calling then is a call that is that outflows, like verse 28, it flows out of God's monergistic work. It flows out of God's divine decrees. It flows out of God's desire to call His people to love Him for His purpose. And this call then is a call that is righteous and good and holy. And it is a call of of, of affection. Let's look at a couple of different temporal expressions of this. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, the Lord says, and he looks down, he says, come down, I'm going to your house. Now, Zacchaeus had no mention in, in his heart of wanting to change himself or come to a place of believing in Christ. He wasn't looking to try to get the Lord's attention, but Christ had Zacchaeus as an object of his own attention, for he was one of Jesus' sheep, and he called him out. And he didn't tell Zacchaeus, hey, 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 would you come down here? He just commanded him to come down. He called him down. This is a very vague picture, a very small, easy picture that a lot of young people can grasp. And all of a sudden, at that moment, Zacchaeus was Christ's because he had been Christ's forever. Did Zacchaeus do anything worthy of being called a disciple of Christ? No, quite the contrary. Zacchaeus was a criminal. He was a criminal by his own laws and by the laws of Rome. He was a criminal and a greedy man. He was a man who took advantage of his own citizens, his own kinsmen, so that he might become richer and richer and richer and more and more powerful. But but Jesus called him. And there are a lot of other places there, the calling of the disciples, things of that nature. But there's one, and we'll get to it on Sunday morning in just a few weeks, actually. And it is the calling. We won't get to the calling, but we'll get into the text of John 11. The calling of Lazarus. Lazarus, dead in the grave, and the, the, the working of the organic matter of his body began to decay. The smell of decaying flesh 
probably permeated the room in which his body was encapsulated. And yet Jesus goes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone. And what do the people say? Lord, the smell will be bad. Let's, let's not, t- whatever you're trying to do here, just turn around and teach, man. Let's not do that. And he rolled away the tomb. Now get this. He rolled away the tomb. My interpretation of that is that there was an odor. And then Jesus says three words. Lazarus! You awake? He doesn't say you're awake, but you are now. Lazarus! Come out! Now this dead man decaying had no propensity for hearing, no ability to respond or to notice his name. He was a bag of meat laying on a slab wrapped in cloth waiting for his body to disintegrate into the earth. The effectual call of Christ. And that's why Christ did that. That's why Jesus did that. The effectual call of Jesus to Lazarus stated for him that he was alive. Lazarus was made alive by the call of Christ. He was made alive. He wasn't given a choice. He wasn't given an opportunity. Jesus didn't sort of make him a little bit alive and say, okay, Lazarus, do you want to come out? He commanded him with all authority, come out. Come out. That's what He commanded him. Come out. Out And Lazarus waddled himself out. I believe there may even be some divine work there in the context of Lazarus' body making it to the door. But either way, Jesus says in John 11 some very prophetic words. And I will expound on these poetically when I get there because I can't help myself. But He says to those around Him, Unbind Him and let Him go. Let him go. Let him go. In John chapter 5, Jesus talks about the voice of God. And he says there is a time, and the time is now, when all who are dead will hear the Son of Man. And that they will hear His voice, and those who hear will live. That's verse 25 of John 5. And in verse 26, Jesus couples that, For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment. So now we have two different ends of things. We have life, which is to escape judgment, and we have judgment. Jesus has both authority to to have both. And He has the authority in life to call the dead, and they live when they hear. You see that? That's the effectual call. He says, do not marvel. He is the Son of Man, and that's why He is the Son of Man, because He has authority to execute judgment. Do not marvel, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs... Now He's talking as what we would say in theological circles eschatologically. He's talking about the last days, where Christ will call all men to life, physically. The very first part of that is he's talking about those who have eternal life, those who have the effectual call to be born again, and the work of Christ aware to them by faith they will believe. And all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will, verse 29, come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Now, who has done good? In the sense of righteousness, no one. So how is it that some can be called to life who have done good unto the resurrection of life? Because those who have believed, listen to this, are those who have heard the words of Christ. And those who have done evil, those who have not heard the words of Christ, the resurrection of judgment. So there are several things, I won't get on them, but for that sense, the effectual call saves every time. 
Those who are called effectually, they do not come and then wonder what they must do now to have eternal life. They are granted life and there is no escape from life, but there is those who have heard an escape from judgment. So therefore, this nonsense and the silliness that we've all heard throughout the last hundred years or so about this judgment of God whereby He will grant favors and privileges and esteem and crowns and jewels and everything else to Christians who have done more honorable things with their life versus those who have not done much at all, like the thief on the cross, oh, sore sad fella. He's born again and then he dies. He'd be good to get a plug nickel if you know what those are. I used to have those as kids. He'd be, good to, he'd be good to get the lollipop stick, much less a piece of candy for his good deeds. He won't even get a star for his chart or his chest. He's just like, well, you're here. Be thankful. Stand over there in the corner with the rat and do what you're supposed to do. Worship. Now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So then in the same way, there's no judgment. For we who are called by Christ do not have to fear the judgment of God. We should never whatsoever fear, even as believers, that we are going to do something in which God is going to put us in a place or a tear to where we would actually have some grief, anxiety, frustration. Aren't all of those things antithetical to the gospel of grace and peace? Yes. It's ridiculous. It's a silly notion. And yet we teach our kids these things forever, much like most People talk about Pierre Noel. If you're good, you get. If you're not, forget it. Can't say that out loud. People get really mad when they, their children hear things. But it's just one of those things that our culture has just become very sick. Because it's the natural state of humanity. But here's, here's the great news. In the, in the latter few minutes I have, let me talk about this call in a way that should give us joy. It is irresistible. The grace of God given to you as a child of God is irresistible. That means in the fact that you can't do anything to come... Or to believe, and God must do something divine in you in order for it to be effectual. The same thing is true is that you will not miss it. You will not mishear it. You will not come by accident, but by the will of God. And therefore, you will not reject it. You will not reject the gospel of grace, beloved. If indeed you are beloved, the irresistible call is shown throughout the entirety of Scripture, just the narrative of the prophets of old, where we see that God caused a king to what? He caused kings to call a census. Why? The man's standing there, he's sovereign ruler, he can do anything he wants to, and he goes, I think I'm just going to call everybody down here and count them, in order that God's purposes might be fulfilled. He caused Pharaoh from his birth to be raised up in order that his power might be revealed in him. He caused Moses to be raised up in order that he might be a picture of the Redeemer. He caused Joshua to be a a, a warrior and a general for the army of Israel in order that he might take the name Yeshua, Yahweh saves. The same name as Jesus. These people are not puppets or pawns in the hands of God. They're purposed. And they are decreed. And they are... Righteous, because they are set apart for the purpose of God. In other words, His work in them are righteous, not they themselves. Pharaoh, of course, not righteous. Judas, of course, not righteous. But His work in them is righteous. For who says to the potter, Why have you made me this way? Does the clay say, Don't do these things? Do this with me? No. So this call is irresistible. God says no one can resist his will. Paul will say that even in the next chapter. Verse 19. God destroys the will of man. God destroys the plans of man. God bends ships under his will. God destroys armies. God destroys the mighty and allows the weak to stand upon the hill of success, the hill of victory. And so this calling is an irresistible call, and it's also a gloriously gracious 
an unchangeably immutable call. I know that was, seems like a bunch of redundancies, but it is glorious, it is gracious, it is done because of God's love, and it is unchangeably immutable. Yes, that's redundant. But I want you to see that the call of God, when it is sent, can never be removed. We've already talked about how we will not miss it, how we will not ignore it, how we will not resist it, but God also will not remove it from us. God will not take away life because in the sense that God has done all that He does to save His people, He is most glorified in their redemption to the praise of His glorious grace. It's not my opinion, it's the opinion of Paul who says that all the things in Ephesians, all the things that God has done in the, in the context of salvation is to the praise of His glorious grace. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, Ephesians 1.13, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. That's a recapitulation of the entire eight chapter of Romans. To the praise of His glory. So, in closing, we look and we see these truths. We see that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. For the very next thing that we'll see next, next week, we'll see those who are called are justified and justified or glorified, but we already know what the next question is. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? So in that, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for Your glorious grace, for the truth of the Word of God, for the truth of...